program is brought to you by the Intelligence Studies Project, um, which is supported uh, in many ways, including financial by the Strauss Center and the Clement Center. Um, so we want to express our gratitude to them. Um, and while we're doing that, we want to remind you of the National Security Forum, which is coming up on October the 12th. But the last day to register is this Thursday, if I've got that right, I think, Paul. First day to register. First day to register. Oh, not the last day, the first day to register. So you gotta get you gotta get on the uh, and that, that the first day maybe the last day is as popular as, as some of the previous ones. So um, we want to try to um, to get into that. Um, we're honored today to have uh, Doug Weiss with us, and I, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read his bio, but I'm gonna summarize it just a little bit here. Um, he's a retired member of the CIA Senior Intelligence Service, and the last job he had was Deputy Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Before that, he was an Army officer, Special Forces, and, and Infantry. Um, he has leadership at all levels of the agency and in the community um, in these many years of service, including having served as a Chief of Station, um, I want to say four times, including the largest station we've ever had in the war zone, the largest station we've ever had, period, which is in a war zone, uh, which I'm not going to mention because of the uh, CIA's weird rules, um, <laughs> the, uh, which I live under as well um, as a retired officer. Uh, I could I could talk a lot about Doug from a personal basis, so I'm not going to do that, but I just will say that he and I go way back. We have very similar beginnings in the agency. We're both Army detailees to the agency, which is an unusual uh, situation. We've known each other. Um, for many years. And just as part of the introduction and also because I see some of the students that took my thinking right and briefing course for intelligence, I'm just going to tell one little anecdote as we get started here. So when I first met Doug, it was in Iraq, and he had a technical question about a very technical collection thing we were doing, which had a complex problem. And so he said, is there anybody that can explain this problem to me? So I go down and get, you know, he asked me if I could find somebody. So I find this guy, who is a former military officer who had left the military, written a bunch of software code, sold it, became a millionaire, and then decided he wanted to be a CIA officer. And he was a very capable guy. Uh, his call sign was MacGyver. He also had a big ego. Okay. And so I told him that I was going to take him upstairs to brief Mr. Wise. And I said, look, you're used to dealing with me, and I'm a field artillery guy. So he's not going to be that smart. This is an infantry guy. So I need you to speak slowly, use small words, and, and that kind of thing. And maybe he'll track what you're telling him. So the guy goes upstairs, and he starts briefing Doug on this very complicated problem with diagrams. And Doug's going, right, got it, clear, thanks, understand, yeah, right, got it, very good. Then he asks me good questions. And then we walk out, and MacGyver says, man. Sir, he's not that dumb. <laughs> and I said, and I said, uh, I forgot to tell you about the two advanced degrees in physics from Dartmouth. <laughs> we went in there. But he said, but then why did you why did you tell me that? And I said, because you just gave the best briefing in your life. And that's the way you need to brief all the time. So I was teaching even in Iraq at your expense. Uh, um, Oops. <laughs> 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 International man of danger. <laughs> Doug is a is a great public servant. He has served in the war zone since 9/11 for I can't I can't tell you how many months. Uh, he is a a leader and a leader developer, and he in the intelligence community he is a unifier not a divider. So we are honored to have you here to talk to us today, Doug. I'll have to keep the podium together while I'm speaking. Um, first thing is, Paul, well, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, as Paul's opening remarks indicated, I've had a lengthy career uh, in the national security business, both on the military side as well as on the CIA and then the, the DIA side as well. Um, for those of you, and then this is more interest than I actually expected, uh, for those of you that ultimately decide you want to enter in to the same path that I took, 
and become a career employee in the national security business. I'm just saying this is what you look like at the end of the ride. <laughs> <laughs> you, you may want to take a different path if you want to look like uh, Paul Pope. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, when, when Paul was given the introduction, I sound like an, an ambitious government bureaucrat. I think, as you can tell, let me turn around. Uh, my hairstyle is quite not bureaucratic. Uh, I have my hair in this fashion for two reasons. One, my wife said you're going to Austin, you gotta look like <laughs> Austin. And then secondly is you know, I live in New Mexico. And if you want to assimilate into the New Mexican culture and society, you gotta grow a ponytail because it's gotta be much longer. The only thing that I've deviated because I think it looks dorky is I'm not wearing a polo tie like this guy's my age. Look, I'm, I'm honored to be here in Austin. This is an awesome opportunity for me, and, and quite frankly, very intimidating, I should say. You know, what an extraordinary university. What a great academic program, supported by just an amazing faculty. You know, talented and dedicated faculty members. And as I said at the beginning, I, I seriously owe a debt of gratitude to, to Steve, to Paul, the faculty colleagues that support their efforts and their programs, and quite frankly, the biggest debt of gratitude and say thanks is, is to you, you know, the students who really make this program what it is. Um, I should also say thanks to the Austin community because I had the last couple days to wander around, become familiar with Austin a bit, and get a really just kind of an innate, warm sense of welcoming from, from the community. And I suppose at this juncture in our country's history, uh, I should also say that, you know, I have to acknowledge the current courage and the resilience of the people of Texas, uh, who clearly over the last period of time really set the example for the nation in terms of how to deal with literally statewide family destroying tragedy. So it's extraordinary. Uh, I also, Acknowledge that I'm the first speaker, I think, of, of the academic year. Uh, and that adds to trepidation as well. There's advantages, disadvantages. The advantages, you don't have a frame of reference, so I'm going to appear to be really good. Uh, the disadvantage is that I may set the bar too low for the following speakers, and they may not achieve as, as well as you might like. So uh, I'll give you a useful frame of reference, I, I think. Now, I've got a three ring binder here, and I've got notes. I normally don't speak with notes, but like Paul mentioned, as a career employee of the Central Intelligence Agency, now retired, I entered on day one for entry on duty, I signed an obligation that I would offer for pre-publication approval to the Publications Review Board for CIA. It's not just a career obligation, it's a lifetime ban. So I have submitted these erudition bits to the PRB and so they have cleared it for me, from my lips to your ears, to speak to you. And so I will use these notes because I'm not allowed to deviate from the notes during my prepared remarks. When we get into the Q&A, I can say any damn thing I want. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'm still adjusting to being uh, associated a year on uh, with the intelligence community. For those of you that haven't been employed in the restricted capacity that I was employed in, as was Stephen Paul, it is a little awkward to be associated with the business of intelligence. I mean, it is hard for me still to be able to say me and intelligence and business in the same sentence. And for any of you that follow a path somewhat similar to mine, if you remember these words, I think uh, you'll resonate with them in the future. Um, I, yeah, I get it that there's also this awkwardness that stems from, you know, when I mentioned that, you know, I had a career in CIA in the intelligence business, particularly in the clandestine business. You know, they often go look at me and then they go, hmm, Daniel Craig, you, Daniel Craig, <laughs> generally doesn't work out that well for me, um, as you can imagine. So it's one of the reasons why I was involved in CIA recruiting. I'm, I'm probably not one of those 
poster child that would attract you to us because you'd be sitting there, I gotta look like that guy. I don't think so. <laughs> but to somebody who I do bear a remarkable resemblance to, Austin Powers, <laughs> as he would say, allow myself to introduce myself, which I think is a quote on the movie. I'm not gonna repeat what Paul said about my, my career. I'm more than happy to address any questions on that when I'm done with my prepared comments. But I will tell you this, that I was given an extraordinary opportunity to do the nation's work. And it is an awesome and noble task. I can't even begin to describe the feeling that you have when you've been given this mandate on behalf of the American people. It is extraordinary. It is the most unique and remarkable agency in government. And I take nothing away from the other 17 members of the intelligence community, including the other one that I served in, CIA, and the other parts of the government that, you know, serve the, the, the people of America very well. But the fact of the matter is that CIA, in many ways, is extraordinary and so unique. I will tell you that I've served with, and what makes CIA so extraordinary is the women and men who serve in it. It's not the institution itself. It's not so much the authorities, the flexibility and agility. It's actually the talent. It's the dedicated women and men who hopefully you may someday become to really take that extraordinary talent and transform it into an extraordinary institution. It's just incredible. And I feel so fortunate because I think that many, many men and women who have finished career and have been retired for a year, you know, sadly aren't able to say that because they didn't have this kind of experience. These extraordinary women and men, you know, I've led them. I've been led by them. I've attended ceremonies where we acknowledged and, and rewarded them. And yes, regretfully, I've attended ceremonies where we've had to bury them as well. So it's not just an extraordinary line of business to be in the profession, but it's also a very weighty profession and experience because of the extraordinary opportunities to contribute, but it's also the extraordinary opportunities for risk as well. I've done a lot of things in a lot of strange places. And like uh, my colleagues, Steve and Paul, it is unfortunate that I can't say very much about them because again, the security provisions that are so appropriate. <clears throat> As Paul said, I did all those things. I had the honor and pleasure of serving at <coughs> all leadership levels at, at CIA. I had the opportunity to be a practitioner. I had the opportunity to be a leader. And then I had the unique opportunity to be part of the land lease program within the IC and be asked to go over and be the number two in the Defense Intelligence Agency. An extraordinary experience for two years that I can tell you more about in the Q&A, but I think I should probably point out that I was Mike Flynn's deputy, uh, which is going to be a little bit of media attention <laughs> because he was relatively controversial at DIA. And I think if those of you who follow the politics of America, he was a little bit controversial during the campaign to elect the current president. <laughs> so I can talk about that. Uh, I asked Steve, given the extraordinary, you know, left and right, up and down, <laughs> and in aspects of my career, where I have what I'll call deep diversity. <laughs> I asked uh, Steve, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he essentially said, anything you want, but here's what I'd like you to say. <laughs> so, um, uh, I solicited what and he recommended I not focus my <coughs> remarks about CIA and the clandestine service and ask me to defer that, render that into your hands. To have you extract that out of me during the QA, which I'm more than happy to do. But talk a little bit about what the poster said was touch on the future of defense intelligence in light of the extraordinary technical advancements that we're now going through. And we're even going to go through more of them at the five year, 10 year, and 20 year mark. And so I spent a lot of time as the deputy director of DIA trying to 
not reform so much as to inspire the defense intelligence community to really recognize these extraordinary changes are going to have extraordinary impacts on the business of traditional defense intelligence. And I'll define de traditional defense intelligence a little bit better. Um, what I want to do is talk about the demand, the information demands of future warfare. Now, for those of you who have never been in a war, I realize you don't have a contemporary frame of reference, but I think in the way I describe it, that won't be a disadvantage to you to understand the thrust of my message. Imagine at the time when perhaps the individual soldier, sailor, airman, and marine becomes less dominant on the battlefield of the future than machines. And then you gotta ask yourself, it was a question we struggled with. What does intelligence mean when you're not providing it to human beings, when you're providing it to silicon and lines of code? And does it change the business of defense intelligence? The answer is, it will very much, and I'm hopefully you'll agree with me by the time I'm done. It's at a time when we're gonna fight a war with not just machines, but human <coughs> machines, and machines that are enabling the small number of humans involved in the prosecution of war. These machines are not just the driverless cars of today, but they're liable to be super autonomous, totally disconnected from the data sets that allow driverless cars to function, because <coughs> they are connected to data. They don't have the data on board. These are super autonomous machines, and perhaps maybe if our engineers are smart and manage to deliver. Maybe they're, they're making <coughs> themselves aware. And self-awareness with machines, that brings a whole host of different information obligations, and certainly to the Defense Department, it certainly does. So imagine human-enabled machines, machine-enabled humans, the autonomous, self-aware, and then we have command and control, both onboard machine, which are far exceed the current software processing we have today and we're entering into the artificial intelligence domain. And then if you look and say, well, how are we gonna command and control all this stuff? It's gonna require artificial intelligence as well. And the minute you get into the artificial intelligence domain, perhaps maybe the software systems too end up having an, aut an autonomous dimension and maybe even a self-aware dimension. And I'll comment to that in a sec. As I'm sure many of you know, we're already on the path to develop these things. The technologies, the symbioses, and ultimately as defense, defense officials, the plans, tactics, and doctrines for this new brand of warfare. If not today, we're going to have to address that here pretty soon. Now this is a journey into the future. And the journey may be necessary, but it's not universally embraced. And you may have an opinion on that as well. And for those of you in the room, probably a small number, you know, who follow these arcane issues related to is artificial intelligence a threat or an advantage? I mean, Elon Musk, you know, has an opinion on the matter. I mean, it was most recently at the National Governors Conference when he said, quote, AI poses a fundamental risk to the existence of civilization. Artificial intelligence the future is a greater existential threat than a nuclear-armed North Korea. And then most recently, in the past 10 days, he said it will be the cause of World War III. Now, there's another dude you may have heard of named Zuckerberg, <laughs> who has an opposing opinion, and his was quite succinct. Comments such as Elon Musk's are pretty irresponsible. Thus, we trigger, for those of you who care, a trigger, uh, Twitter war in the Twitter sphere between these two guys who are probably the most preeminent innovators on the planet today. Out of this argument, Elon Musk, and going back to my comments about we're already on the march, and I'll explain why, Musk is calling publicly, consistently, and vociferously for the control and regulation of artificial intelligence development. A little ironic coming from a guy who would probably eschew government control and government ownership of the private sector 
research and development. When you like it here at the university, if the government of Texas decided what you could study and on what you could write. It's interesting that Musk is taking this path. So I want to talk about that for a bit because it's irrelevant. And I want to give you a little additional perspective, see the process of what I've been saying, and put you in a better position not only to kind of absorb what I will say, but also the arguments on both sides propagated by Musk and by Zuckerberg. Let me just begin by saying, what's the business of defense intelligence anyway? Two examples, Jimmy Doolittle and the F-35. Okay, the Doolittle Raid, task force off the deck of the carrier Hornet on its way to Japan, and I think it's, a, it's an amazing story of human ingenuity and human planning and certainly courage and execution. This was a suicide mission by any other means. What was the intelligence that Doolittle had before he launched off the carrier? It's what somebody gave him before he left. Because of a number of factors, not the least of which is technology didn't allow, but the fact that radio silence was necessary for the survival of the Armada, there was no way to provide him an update to what the intelligence staff gave him and his pilots before they left the carrier. That is kind of the way intelligence has been handled traditionally. You have a basic load, if I can use that term, a basic set of intelligence knowledge, and then as you are conducting your business, regardless of what it is, whether you're a policymaker or whether you're a warfighter, the intelligence community will then endeavor to keep you current and keep you up to speed. And that's the way intelligence is done, it's the way we've always done. And we are starting to look and say, does that model apply in the period of time where we will ultimately have, we for sure will have autonomous machines. <clears throat> it's not clear to me that we will have emotional, self-aware machines with, with feelings. And so I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. Now, I mentioned about modern combat aircraft. You still have a pilot in the loop. You have a, really, it's, an air, it's a weapon system built around a gigantic information processing architecture. The information demands of modern combat aircraft, and I'll talk for the rest of my talk in the context, as much as it pains me as a, as a former entry officer, you know, the aerial warfare context, because it's a good, it's a good man in there, man not in there, how are we moving? but it applies to all the different dimensions of warfare, and I'll highlight that in a sec. But I said, if you look at what the modern combat aircraft gets before it launches, is exactly what Doolittle got. What Doolittle didn't get, we're able to give to the modern combat aircraft. We can update them in route, we can flood them with data, we can take their data, we can process it, regurgitate it back, we can repopulate that aircraft, why? Because we're trying to do two things. We're trying to get the battlefield commander to be able to make an informed decision in the application of that aircraft. And we want to make the pilot able to do the last mile of combat and be able to apply that weapon system in the most informed fashion that he or she can. And modern combat aircraft, they're not just a recipient of data, they're actually a massive sensor suite. So they're collecting data. Remember Doolittle, the only thing he could collect is weather over Tokyo. Nothing else. He could ask whether somebody sees any Japanese fighters in the air. But the reality is modern combat aircraft are flying weapon systems, sensor systems, and data processing systems. <coughs> the data needs of modern war machines is just an in infinite times the data needs of Jimmy Doolittle and his air crew. I might argue, please don't quote me on this, uh, particularly because I have some defense intelligence colleagues in the room, uh, maybe there's no role for traditional defense intelligence. There's a role for intelligence, but maybe not traditional intelligence. I'll allow you to be the judge. I don't really have a firm opinion on the matter. To help you put this in context, let me talk to you about future war. It's not just a single combat aircraft 
or a small number of combat aircraft. But it will be, and I hate to use this term because I find it not particularly, it's just, it's just a heinous term, swarm. Imagine a swarm of these autonomous or self-aware machines. Swarm, <clears throat> that's a lot. Now imagine a swarm of swarms. Now you're talking multiple amounts of these <coughs> platforms. These platforms are doing a number of things, no surprise to you, they collect stuff, they do weapons application, electronic warfare, support, <coughs> and that goes on and on and on. You could have answered that as well as I could. The other thing to keep in mind is they're operating in all domains with a simultaneity and a unity of effort that is unheralded in the history of warfare. Obviously, the unit on the left, the unit on the right, the tank on the left, the tank on the right, the airplanes, the grunts, the sailors, the marines, they all have to be operating under a single set of guidance, war plans, if you will. War plans are generated antecedent to war, and at that point, it's what Clausewitz called the friction of war that ends up perturbing the plan. The cloak expression is, the first shot changes your plan. And having been shot at a bunch of times, I can assure you that that's not just an aphorism, that's a reality. Operating in all domains, and let me just define domain for you. Space, air, terrestrial, maritime, subsurface, and now we have the cyber domain. And they all have to work, as I said, with a simultaneity and a synchronicity that was unnecessary in all the history of warfare that will precede this time domain. Now you might ask, okay, what time are you talking about, dude? And I go, I don't know. I don't know when we're going to get there. I just know we're going to get there. Long after my time, I suspect. But all these synchronous and simultaneous machines, because they're autonomous and self-aware, guess what they get to do? They get to adjust and adapt. They don't have to be told. They have the onboard ability to just know they got to do that. For those of you that are chess players, you play chess in what? Two domains? In modern warfare, it's not three domains, it's four. It's a space-time set of coordinates. So you now have to really think. You have to be fast. You have to be anticipatory. And you have to be smart. And in order for you to make informed decisions, you need to be inundated with all the data you could possibly get in order for you to make an informed move in this four-dimensional chess game. That's going to be hard. So let me go back to put it in, in simple terms as I can. The individual platform. That's a lot easier. I put it in the aerial context uh, just because it's easier for me, but it could be ships, it could be submarines, it could be moving people on the battle space, it could be space as well. But let's talk a little bit and deconstruct <coughs> about what each of these platforms is doing. Now, I think if I ask and we spend five minutes getting feedback from you, will you give me the following list? I'm confident. In a group this size, with your experience and knowledge, easy that I would give it. What are these weapon systems doing? The individual platform. For the sake of simplicity, let's talk about an MQ-9 that is self-aware and autonomous, essentially the Predator. Okay? The platform is receiving data from headquarters. It is receiving data from other platforms. Self-aware, you got to be aware of what's happening in the immediate environment, and you have to be as a machine aware of the context for the swarm of swarms, because you want to be part of all that in a synchronous and simultaneous fashion. It needs to be updated on its onboard data that it left with when it launched from wherever it launched. It's also getting data because, as I said, you know, not only is modern combat aircraft a flying sensor suite, but these machines will be super, super sophisticated in their sensors as well. 
So it's getting data from its onboard sensors. It needs to understand its state of health. You know, how's it doing? Is it okay? Is it full of fuel? We've got good, good uh, ones and zeros. We've got good electrons in the battery. Are we good to go? So assessing its state of health. And it needs to be aware of assessing the state of health of its collegial platforms in case it needs to perform their function. It needs to be able to anticipate this adaptation response because, again, the friction of war will affect autonomous and self-aware machines as well. It needs to monitor its position, relative position. It needs to figure out where it is, how it fits into the greater physical construct of this, this combat campaign. And it needs to communicate not only with its neighboring machines, we'll say laterally, but it probably has to communicate in some fashion with all the other dimensions. So that space, aerial, terrestrial, all that stuff, these guys are leaving before the test. They are. All of that, this machine needs to not only get information from, but quite frankly, it needs to provide information too as well. Because it's not just a single platform, it's a platform operating as part of a greater unified whole. It needs to be updated on, on the adversary's order of battle, you know, and disposition, what's the enemy doing in response. And it needs to continuously observe the adversary. In theory, in the old days, headquarters would do that for you, provide you the update. In these days, in this time frame, it's all on you. Because there's not going to be any time for headquarters to update you. Anything you know about the enemy's response to your behavior is what you're able to collect or your colleague, your swarm of swarm machines are able to collect, process, and provide to you. And you also need to do probably the hardest thing, which is what is the adversary's intent? You want to get prepared. You just don't want to be responsive. You want to be able to, you know, as they said, play where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And of course, that self-aware artificial intelligence processor on board has got to essentially make meaning of all this. And it's essentially performing the same thing you would do if you were the processor on board this machine as well. What does all this mean? What do I need to do? And what I, am I about to do that isn't going to affect negatively some other part of this grand armada, and what can I do to optimize my ability to contribute to this collective effort? Fundamentally, what we want you to do if you were on board and what we want this machine to do is sort out among the behavioral alternatives that it has to be able to, to select from. You know, sharing deconflicting targets, it's a dynamic target environment. All of a sudden, in one second, your target is there, the next second, it's a cloud of particulates. And you don't need to use a weapon system against it. So very dynamic. So sharing deconflicting targets. Do you decide on any target, even if it's the one you've been given, and the one that looks the optimal, at the last minute before you pickle that thing off, should you shoot or not shoot? Not exactly a very easy to distinguish alternative in the fog of war. Then the, then the the platform's got to say, what kind of weapon do I use? Do I use kinetic weapon? Do I use an electronic weapon? Do I use weapons that don't even exist now? You know, what is the optimal weapon system against this dynamic target environment? Got to process, got to figure that out, got to take all that data, evaluate all the alternatives, and boom, it's a gigantic Watson playing chess. Except you don't have the access to data that Watson does, and I'll explain why in a second. You got to evaluate the engagement parameters. I've now got the right target, right weapon system, and I'm not in a position that I can actually apply the weapon. I'm too far, it's too something else, and so the machine's got to be aware of that process that to make a decision. Then let's assume that all of that's done, the weapon is actually applied on target, and then what you have is the, what no surprise to you is you want to say, what did I do, and what do I got to do now because of what I did? Okay, Heisenberg's uncertainty, uncertainty principle plays a role. What I'm looking at, I'm now going to perturb by what I'm about ready to do, and I've done it. So the target doesn't exist, or maybe it does. Maybe I only wounded it. Maybe I didn't destroy it. Maybe it's partially functional, and I've got to be able to assess all that 
Because do I want to use another precious weapon? Because guess what on these self-aware platforms? They may have all the information <coughs> you have. They may have all the self-awareness you have. But they have a limited amount of ammunition when it's all said and done. It's got to figure out what they're using now, what they're about ready to use, and how much do I keep so I can be optimized for the targets and the combat operations that are yet to exist. And then, of course, obviously you want to build in the self-defense mechanism because you don't want these platforms to be so perishable and so vulnerable to the adversary that a simple little act on the part of our enemies will result in destruction of platforms, swarms, and swarms of swarms. Okay, so they got to have a self-preservation sense about them, and they more to just being, uh, I think, of risk. They need to be able to manage that risk, and there's a number of different ways you can manage the risk. Move, or you can do, eliminate the risk. The machine's got to be able to do that. Now, that's going to matter to a guy like Elon Musk. Because having a self-aware machine that's able to defend itself against its very creators is something that's unappealing and may look a lot like Skynet and the Terminator, actually. In addition to all this stuff, it's got to navigate. It's got to do all this by suppressing all the <coughs> signatures so the adversaries can't learn by its emanations. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on inside that, that real machine. And again, going back to my earlier comments when I said some of the essential things about war are how effective the individual fighting element is, but ultimately individuality on the battlefield isn't going to get you to success. It's unity of effort of individual actors and operators individual units. So unity of effort in war is not just necessary, it is essential. And so in this milieu of independent machines, self-aware machines, autonomous machines, operating at a time scale that the human mind can't even get their heads around, you know, this is going to be, I think, very difficult. Traditionally, I think you can understand how we command and control warfare. Okay, you had a commander, and you had those who were commanded. <clears throat> the commander is has a god or goddess-like perspective because the entire organization is structured to feed them the information they need to make an informed decision. So they do that as quickly as they can, and then they make a decision and communicate it down. Okay, well, that means that you got to have two things. You got to have time and you got to have connectivity. And so, going back to the Google issue, you can leave with a basic load of knowledge. But if I don't have the time or the connectivity to update you, dude, you're on your own. And that's why it's highly beneficial to have an autonomous and self aware weapon system. Because there's no ability for that traditional commander to do traditional commanding things because the time scale of warfare in the future is just not going to allow. Too little time, too much data, too many variables, even back at Starfleet Command. And having one person, even with a very talented staff and a very efficient staff process, it's just impossible, it would be impossible for that military staff command machine to be able to integrate all those complexities and provide meaningful instructions, even if you had the time and even if you had the ability to communicate. And so really, it's that onboard artificial intelligence that will really be the action element of future combat. Now, combat's still going to be brutal. It's going to be a lot less bloody, perhaps. But the loss of machines is clearly not the same thing as the loss of an American fighting man, an American fighting woman. It's not the same. So like our brothers and sisters today, 
who go into combat and come back from combat either as heroes or those who are afflicted with serious physical disabilities or more frequently serious mental and emotional disabilities because of the horrors of war. If you had a self-aware machine, is it possible that that platform, that swarm, that swarm of swarms could come out of that same brutal, vicious combat the same way our fighting men and women return from Afghanistan and Iraq. Emotionally different, psychologically different in some cases than they left. And so ultimately, I think we've got to ask ourselves, what's the ultimate consequence of the existence of these self-aware weapon systems? Because the first order effect is going to be, you know, benefit to the immediate combat. But as guys like Musk will ruminate over what are the second, third order effects of having these kind of very sophisticated, cerebrally sophisticated <coughs> machines. And then if you figure out that you have a machine that really understands the second law of thermodynamics, and I won't explain that because I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the second law of thermodynamics. What happens to these machines when they're able to transform energy into physicality and they're able to enter into the realm of self-repair and even self-replication? And can we, in fact, code that in? And again, all this presupposes that our talented women and men, code monkeys of the future, are able to somehow render our, our happiness and our joy and our sadness and our depression and our exhilaration and our likes and dislikes and the way we emotionally manage information, intelligence, how do you render that into ones and zeros? And how do you render that into silicon? And so what is the consequence of near human-like intellectual capacity in these machines that are not just benevolent machines, these are machines of war? So in the end, you know, you have to ask yourself, because I did. <laughs> Is there a role for the traditional business model of defense intelligence? Because again, as I said, <laughs> the necessary conditions are time and connectivity. You don't have the time. The speed of conflict is too great. You don't have time to pass your perspective back for them to cogitate on it and for them to pass back guidance. Time doesn't allow that. The adversary is moving with the same kind of speed, the same kind of adaptability and alacrity, and it's moving at the, with the same kind of capability that we are. Because unlike combat in the past, and I say combat today, we in the United States have had the luxury, and I take nothing away from the courage of our, of our uniform military and the wisdom of our defense officials. But the reality is, for the most part, We've been engaged in combat with a less sophisticated adversary. Certainly as lethal as a sophisticated adversary, but not in scale. Warfare in the future isn't going to be against a less sophisticated. It's going to be against a near-peer adversary. And so for the first time in the history of our country's warfare, we're going to be facing somebody who is equally as capable as we are which again plays into the whole raison d'etre and the motivation to pursue this kind of machine and software development in spite of what you and I might lay on the table as some possible second, third order effects that might argue against that. Because as opposed to what Elon Musk is, is postulating, the reality is we don't want to be the less sophisticated adversary. 
in a war that's 20 and 30 years from now with the Chinese or the Russian Federation or another unanticipated near peer adversary. So, if I might just conclude with a couple of remarks. <coughs> I know that I probably didn't give you a very positive picture of what the ultimate consequences of this journey might be. Now, before you go out and unplug your Alexa and Amazon Echo and you disable <laughs> Siri on your iPhone, I would offer for you the following, and it does bear into countering Elon Musk's argument and apprehensions over the path of this development. Well, these platforms and this collection of platforms, the swarm, swarm, and swarms, it'll be unimaginably complicated. We're not talking about a hundred. We're not talking about a thousand. We're talking about thousands. Thousands. Space, high altitude, low altitude, ship, subsurface, terrestrial, and cyber. Thousands of what you and I would call weapon systems. Unimaginably common. <laughs> it will require, as I mentioned, onboard software and artificial intelligence that's far beyond what you and I in this room can imagine. Onboard firmware systems and subsystems to drive the time domain on board down. You want to put it into hardware, not software. And you know what happens when you hard code something into, into hardware, you can't change it. Which gets to the next point, which says all these operating systems, platform, platforms, <coughs> swarms, swarm of swarms, they all have to be the same version of the operating system. And for those of you that have, unfortunately, Android phones, you know what it's like to keep your phone current with the operating system, unlike those of us that have iPhones. They have to be the same version. Why? Because you want compatibility, correct? Right? The updates as it updates in real time. And you can imagine the thousands of developers working on the different systems, the swarms, the AI, the command and control, the AI that's driving the swarm, the AI that's driving the swarm of swarms, the AI that's driving the single platform itself. Thousands of developers, all with different coding styles, all with different ways of writing, all with different code. You do C++, you do whatever, but all the versions have to be certainly interoperable. And of course, they're going to require tremendous amounts of data, either before their deployment or during their deployment. And again, I already beat to death the notion that you're just not going to have access to much data as soon as you deploy if you're an autonomous and self-aware machine. Processing on board, the power will be amazing. And guess what on board, guess what processing requires? It requires not only stuff, but it requires power. And equally importantly, it requires thermal management. You imagine how hot this weapon system is going to get physically. How do you do the thermal management? As I said, in uninterrupted communications <coughs> is the coin of the realm in any combat. Guess what our near-peer adversaries already acknowledge and recognize? The United States today, even far less sophisticated in its combat plans, doctrines, and tactics and capabilities today, is clearly dependent upon uninterrupted access to communications. Just the way it is today, it's going to be the way it is in the future. Guess what our adversaries are going to do? They're going to spend more time interrupting that then they are shooting stuff out of the sky, the sea, and the space. It turns out, where does our greatest preponderance of communications lie? In the spatial domain. So that's why it's no surprise when you read in the media that the Russians and Chinese are spending an awful lot of energy and time and money and talent into being able to do combat in the domain of space. Again, as I said, they, these platforms have to be interoperable. They have to get updates. There's a whole bunch of stuff. The data out, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff that I outlined for you that are necessary behaviors 
internal behaviors of these weapon systems. And oh, by the way, if it's a flying system, it requires fuel. If it's a floating system, I think it requires fuel. If it's on land, if it wants to mobilitate, I think it's going to require fuel and energy. And so I think there'll be limits on that as well. And there'll be stress. And then I might argue that if these are emotional, feeling-laden weapon systems, do we have an obligation to bake in our national core values and our morality? And if the answer to that is yes, how do you do that? Because even today, when we use very lethal kinetic means, the U.S. military goes through, and as I'm sure some of you know that have had this experience, extraordinary processes to minimize to the greatest degree that humans possibly can to reduce the likelihood of innocent loss of life. It's hard enough for humans to do today. How difficult is it going to be? Or maybe you'd argue it isn't necessary we bake this in to the sophisticated weapon systems that we're going to deploy in 30 and 40 years. And then, of course, lawyers would probably argue, hey, you need to bake in the law of armed conflict as well, so you need to have a little processing board on there, which is essentially the functional equivalent of the corporate general counsel, who's always nattering in your ears, now don't do that, don't do that, I'll get you in trouble. The neighboring machine will sue you. You'll be in litigation for life. Yeah, we're going to have to do that as well. Okay. Now, all of this stuff is going to have to be seamless, flawless, and perfect in its execution and performance. But guess what's going to happen? The fog of war. The real world's going to impact. The adversary is going to try to destroy you. They're going to try to impede your ability, if nothing else, to talk. You won't get enough, and I'm talking about you, the machine, right now. You won't get enough information. Your components will break. Okay? Something will break. <clears throat> Just like it does in your car today. You run out of power, you run out of fuel, you ultimately will run out of ammunition. And then you'd have some contra miracle from space. You'd have a cosmic ray that would zip through the outer skin of your fuselage, hit the main processor <coughs> through a single event upset. And the whole machine goes into what you and I know is the blue screen of death. Or if you happen to have a Windows machine, that little hourglass thing, which causes you to do what? To reboot. I don't know how you reboot something that you can't talk to. I don't know how it can reboot itself if it doesn't have the processing awareness to know that it's in the blue screen of death. So it's going to be very difficult. So final comments, if I might. One, we don't know what will be the information needs of combat in the future. So those of us, myself in the past, who were deeply involved in either a policy of intelligence provision to the warfighter, or were practitioners in acquiring intelligence <clears throat> for the warfighter, we have not a clue what this will mean 20, 30, and 40 years from now. I would argue that we don't even understand our own emotional makeup. My wife would certainly make that observation in space. How are we going to transform that into the physical domain and into the domain of hexadecimals and binary digits? In spite of what will be the extraordinary machine able software development of the future. Imagine these self-aware software development machines developing self-aware machines. Interesting to think about. So I think it'll be an interesting challenge, if not an impossible challenge, for us to replicate what you and I are and put that into a machine so that it functions in the way that I've described. And as I said, we barely understand the human being's emotional to the trauma of war. <clears throat> Look at the veterans who suffer today because the mental health community 
still can't understand what is the causative factors, what might be the long-term remediation. If you don't understand the emotional aspects of combat, it's going to have to be told in a different way, perhaps, with the machine that's self-aware. And of course, we're not going to be able to give them all the data it needs. And I might also just observe, uh, have you ever used Google Maps? Yep. Has it ever been wrong? On occasion, <laughs> it froze up on occasion. They ever tell you at the last minute to make the turn, you should have made it a block ago, you bet. So these, and that's simple. I think the software code for Google Maps, which I admire, I do great jobs. I think that's going to be uh, very difficult as well. And then when all things go to crap, what is it what we do with our technical systems today? We go to the guy with the ponytail. IT <laughs> or do that. You know, we call Apple Care. You know, we take it into Geek Squad. We call our buddy who is our college roommate who's now just an extraordinary <coughs> technical, technically efficient computer dude. So we seek help from other human beings. I don't know. Are these machines going to be able to do that with other machines? I submit probably not. Have you ever been affected by your internet speed or reliability? Yeah. And then what about malware? Malware will exist in ways we can't imagine. I happen to be one of those 143 million who are just dimed out by Equifax. <laughs> So how is the machine in the future going to inure itself and adjust to its discovery of one board? <coughs> I could go on and on, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that I think the business of intelligence in that time frame is going to be stressed beyond our wildest imagination. Even if we don't get to the point where we have machines that are just like us. I think we're a long way from that. So I would argue to Elon Musk that we're way ahead of the need for government intervention at this point. And the government intervention will certainly not be helpful to those who are practitioners and leaders in the intelligence business that we try to modify, adapt, and change the business of intelligence to match the time frame when there's just extraordinary technology that's deployed in the service of tasks that today we use protoplasm just like you and me. Let me finish there. Again, open it up for questions. You don't have to ask any questions on this topic. Remember, any comment cards on this topic, send it to Steve. I didn't pick this topic. <laughs> 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 So one of the things that what's your name? Oh, I'm sorry, my name is Chris. Yeah, what do you study? Uh, I am one of the. I'm an active duty army officer studying uh, global policy. Really? Yep. Going to be a policy guy? Probably not. <laughs> there's, there's really, no disrespect to Mr. Slick, who is a policymaker, they're kind of an acquired taste. Uh, okay, fire away. Um, so, you might remember as an infantry officer when they, they talked to you about your management of the application of force or, or violence. One of the things that we don't outsource, even if you look at what's automated now, is the decision to, you know, to take a life. You know, whether it's the, the can versus should or would. Um, so, as we develop these advanced capabilities, do you think that is something that we would ever be comfortable outsourcing so long as your opponent is human? So like at the other end, when it's machine on machine, who, who really cares? Who cares? Um, but if we advance quickly and we fight near peer or sub peers who may be employing humans on, on the battlefield, do you think we'll ever get to the point where you'll entrust that decision to, to a machine? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, is it, we don't know enough about future combat and we won't until we get there, right? <laughs> But one of the other key decisions you got to make is how much is it going to cost to get us to that dystopian environment that I just spent 40 minutes telling you about. It's going to cost a lot of your tax money. I'll be dead. Your tax money is going to go into it. So we got to make those decisions now. 
Are we, do we believe that we're going to end up to going toe-to-toe -to -toe with another machine? Or are we going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with another machine with a plethora of protoplasm that's available for us to smoke? Uh, or is it just going to be protoplasm and our near pair <coughs> adversaries will choose to get their parity by other means? I don't know. Those are tough questions. But I think in the end, I think the American people, I think because we today trade off combat efficiency, I mean, that bus convoy of ISIS fighters in Syria, it would have been very easy for the U.S. military to turn those buses into smoking ruins. But we didn't. Why? Because of our core values and our morality. And so if we apply that today, I think there will be an element of that tomorrow as well. And how we invest today to get machines so that leaders and machines can have the ability. I'm going against a machine. The rule set doesn't apply. I don't do that do loop thing. Okay? I'm going against a machine that's got a life in it. Is it a combatant? Don't care. The equivalent machine, I'll smoke it. If I look down on the ground and I see this convoy that looks like a military truck but actually contains a busload of refugees, the machine's got to make a decision. It's got to look and apply our core values. And I'm guessing we're not going to want it to fire. So it's going to be a very difficult, I think it's going to be a very <coughs> existential argument at the time in the future. But in order for us to have a capability like that in the future, we got to spend my tax money today so we can spend your tax money tomorrow mm -hmm. on that topic. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question for you. What do you think the role of communities will be in the time of autonomous machines and warfare? Well, obviously, I mean, we could ask our experts here at the front table as well and they'd give you an answer. Everybody's got a different answer. Uh, first thing is, somebody's got to make make policy decisions. Machines, we don't want them making policy decisions. Okay? Uh, as imperfect as humans are in making policy decisions. Second is, we don't want machines developing grand strategy. Because I think they will not be able to do that well at all. And we'll never know because we'll never be able to see the underlying code to be able to know whether the machine actually is a cerebral intellectual replicant of us. My Jeep, I have a Jeep Wrangler. Everybody in New Mexico has got a Wrangler. <laughs> it's got a million lines of code in it. A million lines of code. In order for me to add a trailer, I had to have a software engineer come from Phoenix, Arizona to the Jeep dealer to reload the software code in the onboard Jeep computer so that the computer would recognize that I have trailer brake lights, of all things. So, to answer your question, I think humans will, will, make, will have to make the policy decisions. They'll have to make the strategic decisions. I think the leaders of that kind will have to craft the argument to the American people to do the things that needed to be, need to be done at that time. And I think ultimately they need to spend the money and make the investment decisions. And I still think, in spite of the advance of technology, I still think there's going to be a deep and abiding role for the human collector. And I think there's going to be a deep and abiding and necessary role for the human analyst to be able to process the data, maybe not at the speed of combat, but hopefully at the speed of pre-combat decision. And I know for a fact that humans will be as valuable as they are today. They're going to be equally valuable. To <coughs> to be, I guess. Yes, you told me you weren't going to ask the hard question. I lied. <laughs> uh, key question. Thank you, first of all. Fascinating topic. Fascinating set of uh, questions. Mr. Slick, pick that up. Uh, <laughs> but... To have the debates you're talking about, about integrating morality, integrating human values, also uh, requires a degree of transparency 
the type of technology that you're talking about almost invariably has to be highly classified. And then, of course, you get the question of politics. How do we have this debate given these boundaries? So you make it sound so bad. <laughs> Let me make it sound worse. <laughs> it's not going to be the U.S. government that's going to build these machines. It's going to be the private sector. True. Okay. So the private sector is going to have everything you just described, which is the burdens of classification. Mm -hmm. Guess what else? <laughs> Proprietary. Yes. They'll have competitors. They want to have their self-aware war machine to be much more attractive to the to the investment decider than than the other competitors self-aware autonomous weapon machine. So they're going to be, you know, proprietary controls that are going to be put on. So there's going to be like no transparency, which I hate to make the argument of Elon Musk. Not that I want to get into the business of publicly debating that guy, because, you know, I'm just not a Musk class guy. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that's part of his argument. It says if government doesn't enter into the business of governing the development, even in the early stages, we're never going to get to the transparency that we're going to, we may want to have to maximize the efficiency of this technology and minimize the risky second, third order effects. Yes, I'm trying uh, you're an Apple guy. What's that? You're an Apple guy. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, you're going to buy the iPhone? Uh, we'll I'm going to do first. the X, man. <laughs> you, got LED screen. you got that CIA money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm use the honorarium to speak here. That won't get you. That, that, won't get me, that won't get me the battery. <laughs> um, John Anson, I'm a, pre I'm a pre doctoral research fellow at the Center for National Security. Um, some security researchers recently hacked, this, got a self driving car to run red lights. Yeah. Not by un messing with any of the code, but by modifying the physical environment in really subtle ways to get it to ignore the stoplight effectively. Yeah. So now with this kind of, and this sort of stuff is rather trivial to do to, to uh, sort of teach a, solve, a, a machine learning algorithm to do something different than its design is intended it to. So now if we want to have an autonomous weapon system, we have to have a pristine hardware supply chain, software supply chain, mm -hmm. and data supply chain. Yeah. What can we do to actually prevent the, ad keep the adversary out of those? Actually, I very much. The, uh, well, <laughs> have I inspired you? The, uh, those, are, those are existentially good questions, actually. Because many of those, as, as Steve and Paul can tell you, we're dealing with today. Did we buy Huawei stuff uh, for the United States government? I don't think so. Does you think the U.S. government used Kaspersky and, and virus software? I don't think so. Look at the DJI phantom, uh, phantom debacle. All of a sudden, the U.S. Army says, soldiers are not allowed to use DJI phantom drones because of the inherent security risks because, in theory, the Chinese company that builds all that stuff, you know, is acquiring the data, pictures of your house and your dog and, and the valley your home lives in, you know, all that stuff. So big security issues. So supply chain integrity, important. Trust in the men and women who will acquire the material, design these systems and build that in. So. Do we want our adversaries at the very earliest? They didn't have to shoot them out of the sky. They actually know how to, they dithered with the line of code. Why? Because they recruited you to be the malactor in the code development of the system ultimately bought by the United States government to use against our adversaries. We don't even know that because there's billions upon billions of integrated lines of code. And then the hardware supply chain integrity is important. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up the mucking with the environment of self-driving cars. Uh, I don't know anything about this, but could I offer for your consideration that the recent naval tragedies in the Pacific were not because somebody hacked into the ships, but because somebody diddled with the environment, the environment part of which might be the GPS system allowed for very precise true navigation, which might have confused not only the civilian ship, but also the Navy ship. I don't know at all. I have no idea. I'm just allowing for that to happen and saying that what you described is not, you're not crazy. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's not, not unusual. We have to guard against that. 
And so you can imagine the security regime in that time, where I gotta vet you to make sure you're not bad, I gotta vet everything from the chipset, you know, to the firmware, the software, the hardware, the everything where I got, I mean, the, the counterintelligence and counter covert action obligations that we're going to have in that time frame, astronomical burden that I see. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Ariel Stromberg. I'm an undergrad studying international relations. And um, so if you suggest that in the future we'll have um, these semi-autonomous or autonomous machines that are infused with our own um, American values, um, how do you suggest we would react if our enemy is unburdened by those same values? If they don't follow the Geneva Convention or the laws of war, um, how do you suggest our machines would react? Well, again, that, that'll be an interesting core values debate that we're going to have to have as a nation. We already have that today. I mean, last time I checked, you know, I've, I've built my career on the fight against the Taliban, Al Qaeda, and ISIS. Mm -hmm. Last time I checked, those are not signatories to the Geneva Convention. <laughs> they don't comply with the law of armed conflict. And so we're already at a disadvantage with them because there are no rules. It's like the Outback Statehouse. No rules. <laughs> the difference is they're highly unsophisticated compared to us. And so the advantage to us, which overcomes their no rules limitation, makes it possible for us to prevail on the battlefield. But I think it's an interesting question because clearly I'm guessing, and I, I, I don't mean in this public domain to impugn the core values of the morality of our existential adversaries, but I'm thinking that some of them might not, uh, you know, code in the same limitations that uh, your sons and daughters are going to want us to code into those machines. Because we're going to want our capability to reflect us as a nation. And it's the way we've always been. The way we've always been. Yes, up the next. My name is Mitch Burnick. I'm just an old dude from Austin. Hey, I'm an old dude. <laughs> yeah, so, we've been, so speaking of old dudes, so we, you, know, you, mentioned, you mentioned about uh, it, World it, War III. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, you mentioned about World War III and Elon Musk, right? And so, yeah. my, my, but everything we've been talking about really. Um, is, is, is a very localized kind of war, okay? So, you know, the, you know and localized kinds of things. So you, it sounds like if we're going to have a, a World War III, it has to be against a very large adversary on a very large scale. Why doesn't the same kinds of mutually assured destruction, you know, kinds of mentality that happen in the nuclear world happen here? I do. What, what do you think, Steve? I mean, you, you served at kind of that level where you had to kind of weigh these issues. That's a matter of that's a matter of great strategy, how you choose to deal with threats to your, you know, threats to your core interests, whether you choose to deter them, whether you choose to engage and confront them. But it worked before, right? I mean, at least it worked for, 50, for 30, 40 years it, it, and, and against so, large... And so your point, is, your, your question's a good one because it plays into your question about morality, is that, you know, if we bake in our core values, you know, are we going to have mutually assured destruction, or are we going to have disadvantaged our own destruction because we've we've imposed limitations on our own ability to, to preserve our nation defensively. So again, you know, I spoke in a way where the Armada, like the Doolittle Raid, launches over enemy territory. What you got to keep in mind is that our adversaries are going to be doing the same thing. There's going to be an armada of their crap, you know, over the continental United States. So we're going to have swarm of swarms of, 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 of attack fighters, P-38s, if you will, you know, going against trying to knock their systems down. So I think you could argue that as long as we're not so existentially limited by, you know, I hate to say this in Austin, liberal morality, you know, morality, uh, we're going to have to sort that out. But isn't just, that the same phenomenon occurring in nuclear yeah. sort of thinking it Yeah, down? it kind of works. So maybe it'll work then. That's what the question I'm asking. Yeah. In which case, I'd argue, Mr. Musk, with all due respect, right. uh, that you will disadvantage us ultimately so we won't be able to say, okay, you know what? 
we can smoke you as well as you can smoke us. Do you want that? And it's not just, I hate to use the term, pinpoint precision nuclear weapons. But you talk about war in that time frame, it is going to be at a physical scale that will dwarf the ability, except for, you know, enduring radiation contamination that will last for forever. But the fact of the matter is the scale of destruction is going to be extraordinary. Infrastructure gone, people gone, cities gone, society, civil, civil boundaries, civil constructs gone in that time frame, I think. Yes, Back to you. Um, so I'm Dylan Roberts. I'm a student here in the uh, Master of Public Affairs program. And I actually had a question about the electronic warfare piece. And if you'll forgive me, this might get deep in the weeds, so you know, happy to discuss this afterwards if you need to. As I understand it, um, the one of the one of the great capabilities that the F-35 deploys is cognitive EW. Right. And one of the one of the abilities that we have to bring down drones is something like a drone rifle, where we manipulate the frequency and bring down the drone. Uh, what I worry about is that against a less sophisticated adversary who can't overcome cognitive EW and can't manipulate frequencies and bring down our swarms of swarms. The I'm sorry, I know, guys, this is getting nerdy, um, but the the only reliable way I know as of yet to bring them down is an EMP. Right, and mm -hmm. so what I worry about is that among less sophisticated adversaries, that this is going to prioritize nuclear weapons development in a way we hadn't seen before, as a reliable way to generate EMP. And I'm really hoping that you can prove me to be a charlatan or call me Chicken Little or something, because uh, this this to me is is sort of scary for the implications. On behalf of the current president of the United States, I think you'd agree with me. You know, that's one of the many reasons I suspect. That he's asking for a relook at the nuclear capability of our nation. You know, do we have the range of nuclear weapons, not just city annihilators, but is there a way for us to actually accomplish military goals using those weapon systems that don't result in wholesale loss of life? It's just an infrastructure destructive kind of weapon. So I think it's possible. The other thing you got to keep in mind is that often an unsophisticated adversary. Because we're we're too over sophisticated, okay? That an unsophisticated adversary can actually be pretty combat effective. I cite as an example suicide bombers and IEDs. You know, hardly sophisticated. <clears throat> but I will tell you, having survived both, that in fact, you know, we had the ability. If you know, we had, you know. You know, celestial knowledge, and we have the capability beyond imagination. And how do you defend against something as unsophisticated as another human being who's willing to surmount any obstacle in order to kill you, including loss of his own life? Because in our own moral frame of reference, you, the human being, must survive, even if it's the horrors of war. And just the tragedy of combat. So it'll be an interesting phenomenon. One final question, sir. Yeah. The, uh, the notion of building in morality. Uh, it's one thing when you're talking about a, some buses in Syria, it's another thing when you're talking about an existential threat, which I would argue that jihadists have never been an existential threat. Uh, you see sort of a switch where if it comes to deciding whether to firebomb Tokyo or future Tokyo versus knock out that bus? Well, I happen to share your view that terrorists are not existential threat. They have driven us to be the country, the nation we need to be, not the nation we want to be. But the reality is that even though ISIS is not an existential threat, we're still not smoking the 500 women and children that are on those Syrian buses. No, I agree. Yeah. So we're we already applying that discrimination now. Yeah. And will we apply that discriminating discrimination in the future? I'll bet yes. And how we do that, I'm not I'm not quite sure. That's the last question. Let me let, let me just make one more comment. And then I'm gonna see which one of these guys stops clapping first. <laughs> uh, one Again, these remarks, in spite of the fact that I was jokingly saying, you know, Steve was the one who, who asked me to speak to this. 
Uh, he just asked thematically, you know, would you be willing to share a little bit about one of the topics that you were struggling with in your last job? So I selected this. So my comments are not Steve's, can't be attributed to Steve, can't be attributed to the program or this esteemed university. These are mine and mine alone. Okay, no one told me what to say. Steve did not nor Paul. They did not look at my remarks. They did not edit. They did not filter. This is my, I know it's kind of weak, but my intellectual property. Okay. <laughs> so that said, let me end where I began. Uh, thank you very much. I know you had other things to do. Uh, you had possibly better things to do with your time. Some dudes already voted. They left. They were the smart ones. <laughs> yeah. But it's an honor to be here. What an extraordinary academic uh, institution the University of Texas is. What an extraordinary history, both in academics and sports. What a great community here in Austin, Te Austin Texas. A great environment to have you know, a university where intellectual pursuits are ungoverned and allow you to really pursue the, the interests that you have. It's not always that case everywhere, even in the United States. And I might also reiterate again, what an extraordinary example to the nation that the people of Texas showed us all. I live in New Mexico, water's hardly a threat. <laughs> But what an extraordinary example to the nation of the courage and the resilience, the coming together, the unity of effort, you know, the mutual support in light of the most recent hurricane tragedy. Just extraordinary. It's an op it is a great honor. Thank you for giving me this honor. I appreciate you being here this afternoon.